is now my task to introduce our speaker. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wiradjuri people, the traditional owners and custodians of the Bathurst region. And I sincerely hope that the lecture tonight will be understood and accepted by the Wiradjuri people, past and present, as a gesture intended to honor their connection to this country. It is my pleasant duty to introduce our speaker for the ninth Theo Barker Memorial Lecture, Dr. Stephen Gaps. Dr. Gaps comes to us tonight as an historian with many accomplishments. He is the author of two award-winning histories. His book, Cabregal to Fairfield, A History of a Multicultural City, was awarded the New South Wales Premier's Award in 2011 for regional and community history. His study of frontier conflict in the Sydney area, entitled The Sydney Wars, Conflict in the Early Colony, 1788 to 1837, received the inaugural Blaise Car Carleon Award in 2011 for the writing of military history. And now he has recently published, as of only a few months ago, a book of particular interest to Bathurst. Gudiara, the first Wiradjuri War of Resistance, the Bathurst War, 1822 to 1824. And I anticipate another award will soon be coming his way for this thoroughly researched and beautifully written book. Now you might ask what Stephen does between writing award-winning books. The answer is he keeps very busy. Stephen is a past president and member of the New South Wales Professional Historians Association. And if you look on your program, I have just decoded MPHA for you. At the present time, he is president of the History Council of New South Wales, as well as a co-joint lecturer in history at the University of Newcastle. At Newcastle, he is a key member of their ongoing project to research, record, and analyze the history of frontier conflict in colonial Australia. And to top off his busy days, Dr. Gaps is a senior curator at the National Maritime Museum in Sydney, and he's taken a time away from working on a new exhibition to be with us tonight. I asked him to explain the subject of the new exhibition but it was just too complex for my simple mind to grasp. <laughs> and finally, to offer you a glimpse of Stephen, the private man, he has a dog by the name of Shady, who alas cannot be with us tonight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest lecturer for the ninth Theo Barker Memorial Lecture, Dr. Stephen Gapps, his lecture is titled, there it is, Tumble Down White Fella, Declaring War in Bathurst in 1824. So please, welcome Stephen. Thanks so much, Robin. How can you top that? Um, thank you, everyone. Before I begin, I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners. Um, from where we're gathered today, pay my respects to elders past and present, uh, and acknowledge their continued connections to land, country, and water. Um, also wish to acknowledge any Australian First Nations people here tonight, and to acknowledge we are gathered on unceded Wiradjuri lands. I'd also like to thank the Wiradjuri people involved in the research and writing of my book that I'll be talking about tonight, in particular, Uncle Bill, Dinawan, uh, and as well as all the other people from the Bathurst Elders Group. To all those who assisted with the research for this project, a huge mandang guru, or thank you. Before I start, I'd just like to thank the Bathurst uh, and District Historical Society, Bathurst Regional Council and the Mayor and Councillors, in particular, Jess Jennings, who supported this project all along, and the Theo Barker Lecture Organisers for inviting me to talk here tonight. I'm very humbled to be part of an amazing line of historians in this annual event, 
and to have such a great audience. Thank you so much for everyone coming out tonight. Uh, and particularly, I'd like to thank Robin for his enthusiasm and support. So, the talk tonight will focus on research conducted for my recently published book, Good Yara. I'd like to explore a few particular areas and themes that came from researching the early period of the occupation of Wiradjuri lands by colonists and to attempt to shine a bit more light on a few of these areas. How effective Wiradjuri re resistance warfare was, how the British regarded this conflict as a war at the time, and perhaps most importantly, how we have truly failed to comprehend and commemorate the Bathurst War. So over many years of writing history about the first settlement west of the Blue Mountains, about uh, road making, about convicts, about bushrangers, explorers, pioneers, the Bathurst War has received very little attention from historians and very little emphasis in local histories. Any trace of the war was virtually forgotten during the great period of colonial expansion across uh, New South Wales during the 1830s and then all but completely erased by the gold rush period of the 1850s. It was not until the 1880s that so-called old timers and their children, such as the pastoralist Sutter and Cox families, began to put pen to paper and recall the war as part of local stories about the hardships suffered by the so-called pioneers in those so-called early days. From Charles Sloman's 1938 History of Bathurst to Bernard Greaves' 1959 work, The Story of Bathurst, the writing of history in Bathurst included but a handful of sentences about the people whom the colonists dispossessed. But by the late 1960s, some local historians had begun to pay more attention to the story of the warrior and leader Windredine. Initially known by the colonists as Saturday, Windredine rose to prominence in 1824 as a significant resistance leader. His story, and even his traditional name, was largely only remembered by non Wiradjuri people through his connections with the Sutter family on whose property the warrior was buried. Then in 1971, Tom Salisbury and Percy Gresser published Windredine of the Wiradjuri, Martial Law at Bathurst in 1824. Now this was groundbreaking local history written by non-Aboriginal people. Indeed, their albeit brief publication came to be regarded as the definitive account of the Bathurst War and has remained so. In the 1970s, the telling of Bathurst's history was slowly changing. But Windredine of the Radri was, as the authors put it, a story of, quote, tragedy and suffering. It focused on massacre, not resistance. It, and it ended with a patent untruth. And, quote, and so the Wiradjuri people of the Bathurst area gradually disappeared and have finally vanished. Now, Wiradjuri people around Bathurst certainly had to confront what Ambiang man and Aboriginal historian Callum Clayton Dixon has called the colonial apocalypse. But as Clayton Dixon shows in the case of the New England region, Aboriginal people did not merely vanish under the juggernaut of the British occupation of their lands, they both fought back and survived. It took Wiradjuri woman Mary Coe's 1986 publication, Windredine of Wiradjuri Koori, to bring the survival of her people into the fore, uh, into the broader story of warfare and killing around the, the 1820s around Bathurst. Still, other historians writing about frontier war conflict, even in the 1980s and 1990s, continued to see Wiradjuri's resistance as a valiant but ultimately tragic affair conducted against impossible odds. Now, new research from Wiradjuri military historian Angus Murray and Frontier Wars historian Ray Kirkov, amongst others, has begun to change our understanding of Aboriginal traditional and colonial resistance warfare and how, how effective it actually was on the frontier. In my book, Gudjara, the idea that the Wiradjuri were, as Bathurst historian Theo Barker wrote, wandering bands who attacked Europeans as opportunities arose is shown in a fresh light. Gudjara pays much more attention to the voices of Wiradjuri people in the historical archives, to their stories that continue to be told today, 
and to a clearer understanding of how, just how military operations occurred in the far-flung and always overstretched edges of the colony of New South Wales. Gujara, I think, clearly shows that a coordinated, sustained and intense campaign occurred, a campaign that threatened the core of the colonists' vast enterprise of occupying Wiradjuri country and stocking it with sheep and cattle. In some ways, local and other historians were bound to get that a bit wrong. For various reasons, the historical, oral and archaeological evidence is lacking. Um, it's, sometimes it's missing um, or still to be revealed. Wiradjuri people who still hold stories have often been ignored. While there have been treatments of the warfare at Bathurst in various general frontier war histories, many of the questions posed by historians 40 years ago about the extent of violence and massacres that occurred in 1824 remain unanswered. As historian Emma Dorton suggests, the limited record of escalating violence from 1823 and the period of martial law in the latter months of 1824 leave the historian with a hazy understanding of the nature of the severity of the conflict. Gudjara att attempts <clears throat> to clear a little of this haze by revisiting the historical archives and taking a broader approach to local history. Considering the push and pull of capitalist pastoral expansion and how graziers such as William Cox condoned the killing of Wiradjuri men who attacked the colonists' property. It also looks for the first time at many of the minor players beyond the story of the heroic resistance leader Windredine and his relationship with the Sutter family. People such as the guide Aaron, who helped the colonists find new pastors. He helped track down Wiradjuri men who had stolen cattle or killed Europeans but who was then, despite his obvious commitment to the British, killed in a massacre. In the research for this book, it was important for me to, to walk across the landscapes where these events occurred and to talk to the people who hold stories about it all. I also hoped that knocking on the doors of local history societies and descendants of early colonists might unlock a few dusty cupboards with new information in them. In some cases, it did though perhaps not as much as I had hoped. However, I'd like to think that the publication of the book will, in an environment where keeping one's ancestors' involvement in massacres is a secret, is changing, that the book will drag out some more stories and perhaps find answers to some of the questions that I could not. Now, the fight back against the colonists and their tens of thousands of sheep and cattle that were entering Wiradjuri country was announced by warriors in 1823. They told the colonists in no uncertain terms that the Wiradjuri were going to tumble down white men, to kill all the white men. To understand how after eight years of comparative peace and cooperation, things had come to this, we need to understand the pressure that was building on the Wiradjuri people and how they saw opportunities to halt the expansion of the colony. The summer of 1823 to 24 in the colony of New South Wales was a harsh one. Pastoralist and bushman William, J William Lawson Jr. complained in a letter to his brother about how unusually hot it had been and noted that around the Bathurst area there was no grass worth speaking of. Their father, as you probably know, had crossed the Blue Mountains in 1813 and had been commandant at Bathurst. By 1824, William Lawson Sr. had established a large sheep and cattle run to the south of Bathurst, and it accrued huge wealth from this and other stock runs in the district. Lawson Sr. also called it a, uh, an uncommon dry summer and directed his sons and their workers to shift all his sheep to the Mudgee area where there was still pasturage. After establishing a small settlement in 1815 and a highly regulated occupation of Wiradjuri lands, by 1822, Governor Macquarie had been replaced by Governor Brisbane. The new governor had been tasked with opening up land west of the Blue Mountains to stockholders eager to occupy the fertile country that Wiradjuri people had maintained for thousands of years. The superintendent of government stock, John Maxwell, had 6,000 sheep and cattle under his charge in the various government stations around the Bathurst Plains. In March 1824, Maxwell was forced by the drought to send a large number of stock back to the Swallow Creek station just to the west of Bathurst Township. 
After raids and attacks by Wiradjuri warriors, the station had been abandoned in 1823. Like much of the fringes of the Bathurst Plain, Swallow Creek is flanked by rolling hillsides. The western edge of the creek rises to a significant peak topped with huge boulders. From this rocky peak even today, you can look out in a wide radius over the plains towards several prominent ridges towards present day Bathurst, Orange, and across towards Kings Plains near Blaney. In March 1824, anyone watching the huts and yards at Swallow Creek from these hills would have seen a procession of stock and a handful of convict workers returning to the abandoned station. They would have also seen there was no military presence and few, if any, firearms among the stockmen. Within days of its reoccupation, the Swallow Creek government stock station once more came under attack. On the afternoon of Friday the 19th of March, Patrick Ryan, Crown prisoner and government station, uh, stockman stationed at the Swallow Creek, was out grazing the government cattle in his charge when a, quote, a large body of blacks, to the best of his belief, about 150 in number, came and herded his cattle in various directions. Alone and unarmed, Ryan ran as fast as he could, pursued by about 20 of the mob who came up with him, one of which knocked him down. According to Ryan's, Ryan's latest statement to Magistrate William Lawson, he was then held down and stripped of his clothes and released. He took off once again, making for a hut about a mile and a half uh, distant up the Swallow Creek Valley, where he gave the alarm to two other stockmen who were there, Michael McKayley and John Anderson. McKayley then went up to the judge advocate station at Kings Plains and immediately gave the alarm to the military station there. Now the military at judge advocate of the colony John Wild station were in fact two soldiers, privates John Softley and John Epsilon or Absalom. Such a small detachment of soldiers may seem unusual. From 1822, the growing number of sheep and cattle out stations spreading around the Bathurst region had been under regular attack from Wiradjuri warriors who were taking or destroying stock and threatening to, quote, Murragarund whitefellows or tumble down, kill all the whitefellows. But the British military had learned several key tactics from experiences of guerrilla warfare in the Sydney Wars, especially between 1814 and 1816. As Governor Brisbane noted in June 1824 about Bathurst, the infantry have no chance of success against warriors in rugged terrain in particular. Before the establishment of the mounted police in 1825, the military's response was to create a network of small garrisons dispersed around the outstations, rather than to attempt fruitless punitive expeditions on foot. John Anderson remained at the Swallow Creek hut, and then according to Ryan, the quote, the blacks came shortly after about 60 in number, came to the hut, took possession of the provisions and ate what they required. Then in what can only have been preparation to carry off supplies, the Wiradjuri tied up the blankets and bedding and everything the hut contained. According to William Lawson's son, John, the Wiradjuri at Swallow, Swallow Creek were on a war footing. He later wrote that a great number were all marked over with pipe clay, which was a sure token, as he said, they were bent for mischief. When McKayley arrived at the King's Plains station around eight or nine o'clock that night, the two privates acted, quote, agreeable to standing orders that they'd been issued. Another important tactic that the British had refined in earlier colonial warfare was to reinforce such paltry detachments with armed colonists. At Bathurst, with the majority of the Europe European population being convicts, even these prisoners of the Crown were provided with firearms. The soldiers' standing orders not only included adding a hasty auxiliary force to their ranks, but they were to be under the command of the local convict overseer. Suddenly, a detachment of two soldiers became a small unit of five or six muskets with a commander and a force of just five muskets was, as was to be seen in warfare that broke out, able to defeat traditionally armed warriors perhaps up to 10 times that number. Overseer Andrew Dunn was now a seasoned veteran of such operations. He had led several similar detachments in response to Wiradjuri raids. Dunn's party arrived at Swallow Creek around 2 a.m. on Saturday morning to find, quote, the blacks were in possession of the hut and the stockmen unharmed though humiliated. 
stripped and their clothes, blankets and bedding tied up and in the possession of the, of the Wiradjuri warriors. It seems by this time, many of the 60 warriors had dispersed and in the dead of night, banking on the element of surprise, the soldiers and their armed party then attacked. John softly entered the hut first. According to Softly and Epsilon, some of them attempted to escape, but other Wiradjuri men made resistance. And one man then catched hold of his musket and Private John Epsilon when he was entering. Another man had a spade and made a blow at him, which he sloped off or parried with his musket. Otherwise, he said it would have killed him. And the second blow was sloped off in a like manner and broke his musket in two parts. As close quarters fighting broke out in the hut, both soldiers were, as they reported, then obliged to act in their defence as well as they could to secure the most active. There is little further detailed information on their attack, merely that they managed to take three prisoners uh, and two other Wiradjuri men were, quote, killed and the remainder dispersed, suggesting they may have fired at those who were fleeing or that Dunn and the convicts who remained outside shot at them as they left. John Lawson believes the three Wiradjuri men taken prisoner were likely to be hanged. So the Wiradjuri had captured supplies, herded and driven off stock, and attempted to kill two soldiers who had tried to stop them. But after the so-called affray at Swallow Creek, the station did not come under attack again. The government stock station just 20 kilometres west of Bathurst that had been abandoned due to Wiradjuri raids and attacked a second time was reclaimed in a night assault by the British. In late May 1824, Wiradjuri tactics shifted to a new level of aggression. Threats to tumble down whitefellows were carried out in a series of bloody raids that sent shockwaves throughout the entire colony. Full-scale attacks on outstations began right across the region, from the Turon River in the north to O'Connell Plains in the south, as Wiradjuri warbands mobilised. They were under the leadership of men, only some of whose traditional names we know today. Men such as Bluka, Jingler, Simon, Joe, Sunday and Saturday, more famously known as Windredine. The 150 warriors that Patrick Ryan saw at Swallow Creek were operating at the same time as a group of two or three hundred warriors that ex-sergeant and early land grantee Tom Miller reported elsewhere in the district. In early May, the colonists of Bathurst became increasingly concerned that all the Wiradjuri who had been coming into the settlements and outstations for, for years, uh, who had assisted the colonists in guiding and tracking and worked with them since 1815, had suddenly ceased doing so. Communications between Wiradjuri and the colonists completely stopped. It seems that in early to mid-1824, Wiradjuri groups came together and elders gathered to hold what European observers had regularly noted in traditional conflicts as a council of war. In resistance war elsewhere, particularly in Queensland, European observers recorded that confederacies, confederacies of tribes were formed after intertribal meetings that decided on collective action. These gatherings or assemblies were, according to one observer, frequently held to discuss peace, war and alliances with other tribes. It is almost certain that such discussions occurred among Wiradjuri around Bathurst. An intention to conduct all-out warfare generally considers the possible outcomes, a path to victory, a particular gain or a negotiated peace. Historians have generally seen the conflict around Bathurst and elsewhere on the frontier as uncoordinated and sporadic with few specific goals beyond revenge and desperation. Yet a closer analysis of the historical record and a consideration of just how traditional warfare was transformed into coordinated anti-colonial resistance suggests otherwise. It seems that United Wiradjuri warbands aimed to limit the colonists' advance or to push them back to Bathurst and force a negotiated, negotiated settlement of resource sharing. As Uncle Bill Allen Dinawan has, um, uh, and descendant of the resistance leader Windredine noted to me in discussions about the Bathurst War, protocols of consensus across alliances of different groups 
were always conducted in discussions led by elders. A strategy for the conduct of war would also have been communicated by messages, by smoke or other signals, by, or by individual messengers to all Wiradjuri groups in nearby areas. And it seems far beyond. Indeed, a large group of South Coast people were reported by John MacArthur at Camden in 1824 as heading to Bathurst to slay and to eat. The story of the Bathurst War, perhaps more correctly known as the First Wiradjuri War of Resistance, has in the past been seen largely through the lens of the famous leader, Windredine. While his attacks to the north of Bathurst in mid-1824 were fierce and bloody, there was a simultaneous series of raids by other war bands that have been largely overlooked. The resistance in 1824 was total and widespread uh, across the central west region, with conflict stretching from near Meriwa in the upper Hunter Valley to present-day Mudgee in Ralston and to the south uh, of Bathurst near Blaney. Wingerdine's sudden and deadly attacks on the three Pastor, on three pastoral properties north of Bathurst in late May certainly had an impact. In early June 1824, people in the township of Bathurst witnessed a cart trundling through the streets with seven dead convict stock workers' bodies heaped in it. Stock workers across the Bathurst plains were reported to be cowering their huts, unable to leave for fear of being killed. Hundreds of cattle and sheep had either been killed or dispersed or been herded and claimed by Wiradjuri people. By July, the number of dead colonists had risen to 21, with numerous others wounded. The pastoralists and stockholders of Sydney were in an uproar, clamouring for military intervention. A man writing in the uh, Sydney Gazette under the name of Fidelis, very likely William Cox, uh, ex-army officer, first commandant at Bathurst, road builder, uh, and with thousands of his own sheep and cattle in the district. He wrote that the Wiradjuri were about to, cr quote, crush the flowering prospects of our little colony. It also seems to have been Cox who suggested in a meeting with Governor Brisbane that the colonists should form, quote, one continuous line of soldiers and armed settlers to sweep the Bathurst Plains, a plan that may, you may know rings uh, of an infam infamously conducted one in Tasmania called the Black Line. In early August, to emphasise his point, Cox declared that, quote, the natives may now be called at war with the Europeans. But instead of a Black Line, martial law was declared west of the Blue Mountains and the military garrison reinforced. Commandant Morissette responded with a sweep of three divisions of soldiers and armed colonists across the region. The coordinated movements of these units of around 15 to 20 soldiers and armed settlers, led by magistrates, was designed to capture or kill the resistance leaders and to strike terror amongst the people. But it was not the military who ended the Bathurst War. Despite traversing a vast area of terrain, one division travelling to the Hunter River, Morissette's forces failed to contact any warriors, or as Magistrate Rankin disappointedly wrote, failed seeing the enemy. Rankin was, like Cox, clear that the colonists at Bathurst were in a state of war. In fact, it was the well-mounted and well-armed parties of settlers and convicts who killed indiscriminately, such as that led by ex-Sergeant Thomas Miller, who set out with 20 armed men to, quote, hunt down the blacks. Miller later admitted in his memoirs they shot and killed any they came across little and big, young and old, all shared the same fate. As the military was overstretched and lacked horses, and a policy had been sanctioned by the authorities that settlers and convicts were to conduct their own defence, it was the massacre party such as that led by Miller that quelled Wiradjuri resistance. From August 1824, there were no more attacks on colonists, and by December, Windredine famously led his people across the Blue Mountains to Parramatta to meet Governor Brisbane. Wingerdine came, as Governor Brisbane noted, to sue for peace. Perhaps Wingerdine expected some form of negotiated settlement or agreement. Instead, the Wiradjuri received a feast and blankets, and the colonising juggernaut rolled on across their country. How serious really was the threat to the flourishing prospects of this little colony?
Stock losses were great. Wiradjuri were killing cattle for food and herding them in large numbers away from the colonists in order to keep their own supplies of beef. They were running cattle off into the bush and some stockholders lost hundreds of cattle and sheep, a huge economic blow. In 1824, some pastoralists were suggesting they would be forced to leave the Bathurst Plains. Outstations were abandoned. Convicts were given firearms, much to the authorities' later regret. And other convict stock workers were too afraid to leave their huts or the settlement. British expansion across Wiradjuri country had been momentarily halted. The war against the colonists during 1824 would not have destroyed the colony, but it was a serious situation that forced a military intervention and settler vengeance. In my mind, it is a travesty that this Wiradjuri resistance has not been seen as a war in Australian history, and nor has it been commemorated as such by non-Indigenous people today. The statue of George Evans stands near here. As you'd all know, Evans, with his unnamed Aboriginal guide at his feet, is caught forever in a pose of staring out across the rolling Bathurst Plains that he's about to call in to his superiors as ready for occupation. Yet in the centre of Bathurst, there are no statues to Windradine or any other warriors or to the Bathurst War. Now, I'd like to finish up uh, changing tack a little while I'm here with so many people who, uh, who know much more about the broader history of Bathurst than I do. I thought I might float a couple of ideas about the potential for creating a better understanding of our local heritage. This uh, image is of Beulah Homestead near Appen in southwest Sydney. It's important as a rare example of 1830s colonial architecture that, it, that still, at least for the moment, uh, before it's surrounded by new housing developments, in a rural setting. But there is something intriguing about it. In an attached stone room at the rear, there is a narrow window. It's carefully crafted from sandstone with a well-cut groove for an external wooden shutter. The aperture flares out at angles to create a wider window on the inside. It follows the classic features and dimensions of rifle slits, often called loopholes or gun loops. In the 400 odd pages of the Heritage Report on this historic homestead, there are two words about the window, possibly defensive, question mark. This image is of another stone building in the Appen area at the Vines. It too has an embrasure or opening in the style and dimensions of a rifle slit. In fact, I've now identified five similar features in buildings in just a few kilometres radius. It is possible, as several decades of Australian heritage studies of early colonial buildings have rather disinterestedly noted, that these loopholes were made for ventilation in granary structures, or were Georgian decorative architectural features. But there's increasing circumstantial evidence, at least, that they may have been made for other reasons as well. As I hope you'd all know, that Appen was the location of Sydney's worst frontier wars massacre and an area of intense warfare during the 1814 to 16 period. It's known that outbuildings of stone were often the first structure of importance in frontier districts deep in Aboriginal land. So too, we know that in other colonies, such as Jamaica, the British practice was to build domestic architecture with defensive elements. As we know, uh, there's also hundreds of, of examples of rifle slits in frontier settings beyond Sydney. So I've become in <clears throat> interested in whether there were any similar domestic fortification elements in the Central West region. There were no obvious military fortifications built in Bathurst Township. But it was around the outstations where convict workers in 1824 were cowering in their huts. Did they cut loopholes into these? as was a common practice later in the frontier. Were there um, were some domestic defensive structures built at the height of, period, of the period of conflict, or were they built later, with this warfare still fresh in the minds of colonists? Were they built, like many other examples of government, military, and other buildings around Sydney, with several uses in mind at the same time, securing precious grain, as well as defence against convict uprisings, bushrangers, and Aboriginal attacks. <clears throat>
Now, as I mentioned earlier, the written history of the Bathurst War is limited, but there is much more to history than official records. There are family stories, there are rocky outcrops, and possibly colonial architecture that will add to the growing reconstruction of this history. Some of you may know this image of the uh, stone ruin at Kalula, just to the south. I haven't investigated whether it might fit the 1820s response to Wiradjuri warfare, but it shows us there are still potential fortified archi architectural elements in the region that could well do with further investigation and just a close up there. It would be wonderful if people went away after this talk and took note of any such early colonial architecture elements uh, in the district. In the work that needs to be done to foster truth telling and a genuine reconciliation of our past, there is much more like this to be done. Now, I'd just like to draw your attention to this, the uh, Colonial Frontier Massacre online map that has been developed by a team from the University of Newcastle. Just yesterday, the map went through its fourth major upgrade of revisions and additions. As the Newcastle University team says on the website, the project is presented not as a conclusion, but as a beginning. As you can see, there are already a huge number of massacres that have been documented around the country. If we zoom into the Central West, you will see only two massacres noted, one at the Turon River and the other near Ralston. For those of you who might have read Kujara and those of you who haven't, it's on sale outside, this may seem at odds with the many other massacres mentioned in this book. But the massacre mapping project for various reasons limited their defini definition of a massacre to, quote, the deliberate and unlawful killing of six or more undefended people in one operation. As the project notes, unlike genocide, there is no legal definition of massacre or a frontier massacre. However, most international scholars of massacre agree that the minimum number of people killed to constitute a massacre is between three and 10. I gave a talk once uh, on my book, The Sydney Wars, and one of the audience members questioned me and my inclusion of the killing of four or five undefended people being called a massacre. Uh, for this person, a massacre had to mean lots of people being killed. But I ask you, if we look at, th at the three defenceless women who were killed at Eight Mile Swamp, just to the south of Bathurst, by Henry Castles and company in May 1824, was that not a frontier war massacre? Now, to finish, I want to turn from massacre to resistance, in fact, to the relationship between the two. At the, mass at the Massacre Project website notes, from the moment the British invaded Australia in 1788, they encountered active resistance from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander owners and custodians of the lands. In the frontier wars, which continued into the 1920s, frontier massacres were a defining uh, strategy to contain and eradicate that resistance. A defining strategy to contain and eradicate that resistance. In some ways, we might begin to think of frontier massacres as a military strategy largely conducted by frontiersmen who had been encouraged by the large landowners to use the tactic of massacre to halt resistance and informally sanctioned by the authorities since the first punitive expeditions around the Sydney region in 1788. These expeditions were both designed to strike terror into local communities and occasionally, as both governors Philip and Macquarie had ordered, to cut off the heads of warriors and bring them back in sacks and hang their bodies from trees as warnings against further resistance. With such work as the Massacre Mapping Project, we are beginning to understand the extent of frontier violence. We are only now also beginning to understand the connections between massacre and resistance warfare. A resistance warfare conducted against the British Empire and, as Dinawan notes, one that has never truly ended. Nothing has been ceded. As leading frontier wars historian Henry Reynolds notes, Australia is unique among all colonial societies in that not one single treaty arrangement ever occurred between colonisers and First Nations peoples. The impending 200th anniversary of the declaration of martial law west of the Blue Mountains in 1824 
is an important moment in the history of Bathurst. Henry Reynolds has also noted that the process of truth-telling is the ultimate form of respect that non-First Nations people can be part of. The Wiradjuri Gudyara is the story of how Aboriginal people fought for their country and way of life. One day it might, might take a more central role in our commemoration of Australians at war. Recognising the first Wiradjuri War of Resistance as a prominent part of the local history of the Bathurst region will be an important step in this process. The massacres and killings that occurred during the Bathurst War would also feature in any account of Australia's past that was part of a broader investigation into historical injustices. I believe we must ask ourselves why in the Bathurst region are there so many official monuments to other wars, all overseas conflicts, but no monuments to the Bathurst War. Mandanguru, thank you.